good, good morning. Um, I'm very happy to be here in Europe again. I haven't been to, to Europe for a long time, actually. Um, but back home is a very important day in Thailand today because it's the beginning of the Thai New Year. So um, today is the first day of 2,556. And so, so what do you mean to the, the Thai uh, people watching here? <clears throat> so I've been asked to give the talk on epitypification. Um, I'm not in the Committee of Fungal Nomenclature, and so I'm a user of it. So uh, I, I'm talking from a user's point of view, and some of the things I get, I may, I may get slightly wrong, so I'm happy to be corrected at the end. Now, this is one of my students' slide who's in America at the moment. Um, and what is a name? <clears throat> a name is obviously very important. So if you have a name of a fungus, you can get to all the information you need from it. So you can get to the host range, biochemistry, and so on. So it's a very important thing to actually pin a proper name of a fungus on a fungus. So I'm going to ask some questions as I go along that, so that I'll be asked less questions at the end. So, Paul, at the end of, the, at the end of, of my talk, when we have one name and we want to search a fungus and all the information on it, are we still going to have to search for the two names in the database? So perhaps you can mention that near the end, at the end. <clears throat> so what is the name of any fungus based on? Well, of course, it's based on the type, and there are many types. So here is an example of a type, and you can see exactly the type just there, all right? A tiny, tiny, tiny little piece of something. So types are not always in very good condition, but that is what the fungus is based on. The name of the fungus is based on that little bit of dirt there. So there's a problem with many types, and as mycologists, we all try to study types. The material is often very old. It's in a poor condition. Most of the time you cannot extract DNA. I think specimens more than 50 years, 15 years old, it's very hard to get any DNA out of them. Also, you're not allowed to do it. The characters are hard to evaluate. And also many herbaria, or some herbaria now, it's very difficult to borrow specimens to actually look at them. So this is the type of um, Bisospheria schmideriana, which was described in 1872. So this is a really old specimen. And you can see down on the, the, the right over there, the small little bit of uh, material, which is the type. But if you look and you make a nice slide, you can actually get some characters from it. You can see the ascomata, you can see the uh, assay and so on. But what you can't do is to get any DNA out of this. You cannot sequence it. So, therefore, the type is subjective. So when you look at it, you can see the characters, but that, that's all you can do. So what can you do to improve this situation? So in the case of most new species, they are now described with cultures, but actually, as Pedro showed, it was less than 30% have cultures and sequences with them. But old specimens have no cultures associated with them, or very unlikely to have. So what options do we have? So one option we have, which many of us has done, is said this is the same. We've said this is the same as that species. Well, that's an opinion. But it may be wrong, it may be right. I've seen the use of authentic specimens. I'm not sure what authentic means. I've seen the use of voucher specimens. And then, of course, we have epitypes. So let's look at the genus Pestiloteopsis. This is a typical Pestiloteopsis. And... Uh, these guys, which I'm going to introduce to you, are designating voucher specimens. So this is Go Liandong in, in China. He um, decides that this fungus is the voucher for Microspora. And this is Watanabe in Japan, who also works on the genus Pestilosiopsis. She decides it's the uh, voucher specimen for P. neglecta. So there's no... There's nothing in place here to say which one is right. They're both right, right? There's a, it's a voucher specimen. They're both right. It's their opinion. So a voucher specimen will not really work. And if you look why it won't work, you can see here, this is um, Pestiloteopsis from Gene Bank. If you look at all of the red ones, they are P. neglecta. 
and they are scattered throughout the tree. So everybody has found a Pestilotiopsis species and they've named it P. neglector. And really, uh, the interpretation is very different by different people. The same for the blue one is scattered throughout the tree. So people have identified Pestilotiopsis microspora. And they're all different species, but they've all been identified as the same one. So how do we move forward from this? Pestilotiopsis is a big problem because there are no type specimens in that genus. So the problem with type material, we cannot sequence the type usually because it's too old. Okay, so let's get the collection, the um, strain from a culture collection. And my students often say to me, there's a strain in CBS, that must be correctly identified. But, <laughs> but of course not. <laughs> So what we must do is get new collections, and Pedro's already stressed this. I think this is something we as mycologists must do. Get out, find new collections, and compare them with the types. And then we can designate what's called an epitype. And the epitype can be used to sequence, which we can use in our uh, molecular analysis, phylogenetic data. And uh, they're there for future people to study. So I move on to what is an epitype. This is the Article 9.7 of the International Code. And this is the definition. An epitype is a specimen or illustration selected to serve as an interpretive type when the holotype, lector type, or previously designated neotype or original material with the validly published name is ambiguous or cannot critically be identified for the purpose of the application of the name of the taxon. Now, that's a mouthful, but I think you all understand it. So basically, an epitype serves as an interpretive type. So you make a fresh collection. It, you hope it's the same as the thing you're epitypifying, and that's an interpretive type. And it should contain cultures and barcode sequences. And uh, is epitypification is epitypification reversible? So once you epitypify something, is that it? Or can somebody come along and say, no, you were wrong, I'm going to re-epitypify it? Well, no, you cannot do the second. You cannot. Once something is epitypified, it's there forever, unless it goes to the uh, committee and is, is, you suggest a new epitypified. Epitypify Get that right? Yeah. Epitype. <laughs> So if you're going to epitypify things, you should do it seriously because we're really stuck with it once you've done it. And what's happening these days mostly are people are, in reality, using epitypes because they've got sequences from them and they want to use them to move our knowledge forward. So this is a slide I came up with and I've had it in my lectures for about four years and I have no idea where it comes from. So I, I emailed Scott Retter, is it in the code? It's not in the code. So I asked Pedro if, he, if we discussed it over beer one night, but we can't remember. But anyway, <laughs> these are my ideas, I guess, unless they really are somewhere written. But, so if you want to designate an epitype, you really should go back and examine the type material and make sure you have the same thing. And then you recollect. And hopefully in the same location. It should have the same characteristics. So if you have a decent description, it should have the same characteristics. You need a living culture, and you should deposit that, hopefully, in more than one international culture collection. Same hosts, same symptoms. And you should have herbarium material, the culture, and then you should be able to sequence it and uh, deposit your sequences in gene bank. And also, to do it properly, you have to publish it. So without publishing it, this is not formal epitypification. It, it's not valid. Now, that's an ideal situation. That's an ideal situation. And as editors of journals, we should be looking at these and saying, how are, are, are the authors doing this? But it's not actually a requirement, as far as I can establish. So now I want to go through some examples of epitypification. Um, and I've coined these with my own terminology. So this is a gold star epitype. This is the best one you could possibly do. 
and it was done by me, uh, Chai and, and myself fairly recently. This is a sh uh, sugarcane disease, and the disease is Colletotricum falcatum. It's a very important disease around the world. So this um, fungus was originally described from Indonesia, in Java, in a small little village of Komal in a sugarcane field in about 1904. So we decided that we better go back and get this. So I took a trip to J Indonesia and then a trip to Jakarta. And then we had to take a 16-hour bus, minibus drive, across Java to this tiny little village. And I was shaken around. And we ended up in this little village and very poor hotel to stay in. And uh, I ate the food because there were no good restaurants. And the next morning, I was sick. Anyway, we went to the sugar cane field. It was still there in this little field. Amazingly, it was still there. We collected the disease and we brought it back to Bogor. We left some material in Bogor. We took the other specimen back to Hong Kong and we isolated the, the fungus when we got back to Hong Kong. So really, we played by the rules exactly here. So it was a great, it was fun, but a long, long trip. Anyway, so we... It, this, is an, this is an example of a mistake I've made and a lot of people probably make. If you want to designate a neotype, um, an epitype, the original material must exist. Now, we could not find the original type of, of this specimen. So instead, we have to designate a neotype. So if you want to designate an epitype, it, you have to, there has to be an original specimen. So this, so this was um, designated as a neotype, but it's, it's almost the same as an epitype. Anyway, so I sent this off for review, and the expert in Colletotricum taxonomy, who's not here, said, this is not typical of Colletotricum farcatum. I thought, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd done everything right, but, but we had the wrong fungus. But no, we didn't have the wrong fungus. We must, you know, we probably did have the right fungus, and the subsequent trees I've seen in this, in this uh, fungus, it's a complex. There's more than one species in Colletotricum falcatum. And probably the one in India that causes serious disease is not the same as the one in Indonesia. So there's a question there. We've actually epitype, epitypified the right fungus, but it's not the serious disease. So have we done right or wrong? Okay, this is an ideal epitype. So this is one done by Paul Cannon. In the past, if it looked like Colletotricum gliosporoides, we called it Colletotricum gliosporoides. And there was no argument. That was easy. Those were the easy days. So now it's been epitypified. And this is where the fungus was described from. So Colletotricum gliosporoides was described uh, from Italy many years ago, July 1881. Um, and it was collected from the leaves of citrus. So uh, Paul Cannon didn't go back, I don't think, to Italy to collect it because his, ep his epitype is from 1991. So it's probably a collection that was in uh, IMI, sent to IMI. But it's also from Italy. It's also from citrus, orange, and uh, leaf spot on leaves. So it also had the same characters as Colletotricum gliosporoides and all. And so this is a, a good epitypification, I think. Now, this one is in fact, been very important. That's the uh, pictures. Because once we were able to epitypify Colletotricum gliosporoides, this is the complex of gliosporoides. Down there is the epitype. And you can see the other species, Colletotricum kawaii, that actually is a species. We were able to show now that is a distinct species. Fragari, the one from strawberry, Colletotricum fragari, is a distinct species. And also, was there one more? No, but anyway, Colletotricum musei is a distinct species. And so since then, we've been able to show that Colletotricum gliosporoides comp comprises many species. It's a species complex. So epitypification here was so important to be able to let us move forward in this genus. Now, pragmatic epitypes. Um, it's not always possible to go to the end of the earth to find your specimen. So perhaps find other ways to do it. Now, one um, species we want is Pestiloteopsis microspora. 
which was described from Buenos Aires, Argentina. So is any, anyone going to Argentina in the next few months? Please, could you look for it for us? Let me know. But all right, you've got to be realistic. What do you do? You can't, you can't get specimens out of India easily. We have a species of Phomopsis we want from Neem. Now, but we can't get it out of India. My student has the species, but he can't send it to us. So we have a problem there. So this was something done in the Colletotricums on grasses. And uh, this was by Jo Crouch. So she epitypified Graminicola. And uh, by doing this, she was then able to describe many species of grass Colletotricum in the Graminicola complex. But this was her epitypification. And uh, I sent this to, to Scott, and he's, as an example, he thought I wrote it. Um, and he said, this is probably not uh, acceptable. But this was published, and uh, it's actually been accepted every, by everybody. But it doesn't, take, doesn't cite the original specimen, really, vaguely does. And it doesn't really say where the epitype is kept. But it does, but it doesn't. But it's, it's a, bit, a bit vague. So anyway, being pragmatic, everybody has followed this. So it's still being accepted as the epitype. But when you write an epitype, you really need to get the, the wording, the wording correct. Another one is Colletotricum uh, cocoides. This causes little black spots on potatoes. And two minutes, OK. And, uh, this, rather than going to get it from the original place, they just got it out of the CBS culture collection. And Pedro was doing this a lot. And uh, I'll skip that, but it, it is. OK, so going back to, to the original point, it's very important to, to put a name on things. Now, since, since I have a little time, I have a couple of questions. Now, one of the things that uh, we need to think about is the registration of epitypes. It's recommended now by the code. And maybe Pedro would like to say one or two things about that at the end. But maybe when you designate an epitype, you don't have to register it at the moment. It's just recommended. So it's something we should think about as making that we must do. And the other thing that I don't want to talk about at this stage, but maybe David would like to say a little bit, is a teleotype, the use of a teleotype. Because it's quite uh, a little bit complicated. And the last thing I would, my question is, David mentions this morning that we can change the generic type. And uh, it's the first mention of it I've heard. And I don't understand that, so I think that's important to clarify. Okay. So this is my university in Thailand. Um, anybody is welcome to visit and um, my research group. So thank you very much.